Philippians chapter 2, verse 12. Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. God bless you. You may be seated. This is a a wonderful thing that we just read about. It basically says if you really want to go to heaven, you can go. If you really want to see Jesus on streets of gold and talk to the old prophets of old and the great women of faith in the past, you can do that. God's already provided the means and the possibility for that to happen. He has given us all that uh, we need if we will reach out after it. If we will pay the price to get the blessings, if we want it, we can have it. And that's a wonderful thing. But it also is a a fearful thing in that it is dependent on each of us to have a made-up mind to make heaven our home. And so... It's our responsibility. Touch your neighbor and say, you got to work out your own salvation. (laughs) Now, the Lord's given us many helps in this process, in this job that we have to do. He's given us his word. He's given us his preachers and pastors. He has given us evangelists that come and bless us from time to time. He has given us his spirit, which brings many wonderful gifts along with it. It has so many awesome attributes because it is the spirit of Christ. And when you receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, that is the spirit of Christ coming into your body and my body to bless us, to help us, to strengthen us, to encourage us to inspire us, and the gift of the baptism of the Holy Spirit is uh, the greatest gift we'll ever receive in our whole life, because it is Christ in us, the hope of glory. And the Word of God, of course, is our map. It's the directions to how to make it into heaven. And so there is, like all things, you know, Uh, When I was going to university uh, back a few years ago, uh, professors didn't care whether you came to class or not. Now, that's not the way it was even in kindergarten or first grade, second grade, third grade, uh, fifth grade, seventh grade, twelfth grade. They wanted you there. There's reasons for why they wanted you there more than just that they wanted you to hear what was going on. But uh, in college, at least in that hour, I haven't been to a university class in a while. But then they didn't care whether you came or not. In other words, it's all on you, baby. If you don't pass the test, you don't pass the class. And uh, you can uh, come up with all kinds of excuses. But if you know it all already, then when test time comes, the professor will find out. And it's up to you. And as you get more into adulthood, for our young people that are here, more of it depends on you. That's why moms and dads get demanding on the chores you have to do around the house. You live in that home. Somebody's paying for it. Someone's in insuring it, somebody is paying the taxes on it, someone milking the cow and getting the milk in the refrigerator for you, and there's some things you got to do. And as you gain in your uh, maturity, you get more responsible chores to do. And 
but that's, that's a compliment to you that you are trustable. Your parents can leave you with some things that need to get done and know that they will get done. And if they don't, they'll know you've got a mighty good reason why it just couldn't happen. But uh, they are trusting you because you're older now. And so our parents require more of us. God's requiring things of us. And certainly it's a wonderful thing for us to understand if I want to go, I can, I can do it. If I want to get there, nobody can keep me from making heaven my home. I've got a prayer room every day if I want it. If I want strength, I know where to get strength. In the Word, in meditation, and on my knees, or sitting in a chair, wherever you pray. And I'm going to take time there to get renewed day by day, as the Scripture says. The instructions, the map of how to get to heaven is all in this book. And of course, pastors, evangelists, teachers, we hear them weekly, and they're pointing out every time Pastor Nathan gets on in this pulpit, he's challenging us, he's pushing us, he's helping us understand how to make proper judgment in a world that needs a whole lot of judgment. We've got to discern between the clean and the unclean. We've got to discern between the holy and the profane. Not once in our lifetime, day by day, sometimes hour by hour. And so it's a constant challenge. It's a constant training of us to be aware and to be able to reach out and, and get a hold of the Lord for help in our troubles. If we need help, if we need people to gather around us, we have a church body that cares about us. They're touched like God is with the feelings of our infirmities. When one of us suffers, uh, many other people in the body suffer along with them. And uh, we pick each other up, encourage one another, strengthen one another. And this is all in the will and plan of God. That's why the church is called the church. It's a body of believers that are helping each other to get to heaven. Praise God. I'm glad I'm in the church. How about you? Uh, there were numerous kinds of laws in the Old Testament for that generation that they were expected to keep if they wanted to please the Lord. And uh, the Old Testament laws, one, of, one category of them were sacrificial laws. These were many, many hundreds of laws on how to bring a sacrifice to the Lord, a blood sacrifice. And uh, from, a, from a, a, a bull to a lamb to a little turtle dove, you would have been instructed if you lived back then under the law of Moses to bring your blood sacrifice once a year to find redemption and cleansing for your sins. And uh, the good news about that is Jesus Christ paid the price for everybody all the way back to Adam and everybody that's ever going to be born in the dispensation of grace. And so Jesus paid it all. We don't have to keep corrals of animals around here. And... Uh, work with them and the smell and the blood, the smell of blood, uh, just the, you better be glad you're in the better covenant. It's a wonderful thing to be in the better covenant. And we're the ones privileged to be here. Jesus died for all the people that will ever need him as their savior. And if they will obey the gospel, they can partake in what Jesus did at Calvary. I'm glad it covers it all. The ceremonial laws of the Old Testament were the clean and unclean foods, the different uh, uh, rules of washing and uh, cleansing, the feasts, all the feasts of Israel uh, that w went on just every few, every couple of months. There's another feast that is uh, honored by Orthodox Jews even to this hour. The observing of special days, the Sabbath days, 
many things are, are in this, the ceremonial laws uh, that uh, it's, it would be difficult to, to keep up with them, bottom line. And uh, Jesus, when he was here, he told the paralyzed man on the Sabbath day, take up your bed and walk. Jesus said the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. In the New Testament, every day is a Sabbath day. Every day is a holy day. Every day we give it to the Lord. But we all need a day of rest every week if possible, unless you're in an emergency situation. Take time to, to rest and uh, get out of your normal go, 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 go mentality and off your treadmill and take time to rest. And so it's a wonderful thing to, to realize that the Lord had it all planned. But the ceremonial laws, Jesus came against them. He talked about how that unclean animals, they could be eaten. And, of course, the Pharisees criticized him for telling the paralyzed man who had just healed to get up and walk, take up his bed and walk. It was on a Sabbath day, and they determined that he was telling them to Work by taking up the bed. Work. You're working on the Sabbath day. So uh, after so many of those violations by Jesus, uh, they were ready to kill him. But he came up out of the grave. Praise God. Then there are the moral laws. These are three main categories of the Mosaic laws. And the moral laws, uh, they were brought over into the New Testament. And uh, the, the adultery was wrong in the Old Testament, still wrong in the New Testament. Uh, committing murder was wrong in the Old Testament, still wrong in the New Testament. And on and on that goes. And so those, those laws were uh, reiterated, spoken of, mentioned again in the New Testament. For the most part, uh, others were defined maybe even more clear in the Old Testament but they're mentioned and brought forward into the New Testament. The Apostle Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, said in Ephesians 2.20, let me get my helper here. We are built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all of the building fitly framed together grows into a holy temple unto the Lord. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal. The Lord, Lord knows who are his. And let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquities. And so it's true that uh, stand, Christian standards, Christian rules of conduct, Christian uh, things that we're committed to, I'm talking about our directions to heaven. How many want to go to heaven? Maybe not today, but we want to go, right? <laughs> the Lord put the desire to live in us, so it's okay. If we want to wait till tomorrow to go, maybe. <laughs> but uh, every profession has its standards it keeps. The police, the firemen and women, doctors, teachers, truck drivers. Every company has its standards. Duke Power, IBM, McDonald's. UNCC, Carolina Medical. Every family has its standards. There's certain things, families, it's just uh, the culture of the family. We do these things. We don't do these things. And uh, every person has their own set of standards. As they mature, they require of themselves. Requirements are a blessing in our lives. Self-discipline is our friend. Denying ourselves for the present so that we can have something wonderful in the future. That's not stupid. That's very wise. And so these standards that the Lord has put down in the word of the Lord, these guides, this is the map on how to get to heaven. And Romans 8, 13 says, for if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the spirit do mortify, the deeds of the body ye shall live. 
And as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Hallelujah. So it's important that we are uh, led by the Spirit of the Lord. Present day spiritual guides in our life. Let's just hit a few of these that will help us. First of all is personal convictions. Personal convictions. The Apostle Paul talked about it in the New Testament. He says, if uh, eating meat offends my brother, we're not talking about just any meat. We're talking about meat that's been sacrificed to an idol, used in uh, idol worship. Now, the meat doesn't know it was used in idol worship. The meat is not affected. The meat may be filet mignon. It's irrelevant. But to some people, the fact that it was used in honor of a God, it offends their conscience. And for that person, they don't need to be eating the meats, especially if they think it's got some stuff in it, you know, some, some uh, magic in it or something. And, uh, and Paul said, if eating meat offends my brother, I will not eat meat. At least while I'm with him. I might eat it later, but I'm not going to offend my brother. And he was very serious about this, that we've got to take care of each other. Some people have very weak conscience. We're not talking about covering up sin. This is the, the meat, again, had nothing to do and was not affected by being sacrificed to an idol. Uh, but uh, the effect, offense to my brother. Now, that's, that's the problem. And some people don't want to have to worry about their brother. Like, like uh, uh, Cain said, am I my brother's keeper? Well, in the house of God, yes, we are our brother's keeper. We can't stop them from doing what they want to do, but we've got to encourage them and help them and strengthen them and lift them up. And so the Spirit will deal with us as individuals to put barriers and walls in our life. If you've had a besetting sin in the past, the Spirit of God has dealt with you already about dealing with that besetting sin. What's a besetting sin? It's one that's easy for you to not worry too much about. Easy for me to commit and not feel check of my conscience. It's a besetting sin. It's, it's just convenient and it's... Uh, it's not a bad sin. It's a, it's a, it's a little sin. <laughs> not a big one. Uh, and so, whatever it is, the Spirit of the Lord will deal with us and put his finger right on it and say, you need to stop listening to that. You need to stay out of that website. Now, if it's bold and blatant, of course, we know so if it's full of wickedness and ungodliness and displeasing the Lord, we'd already know. But it's just something that's on the edge. If listening to love songs, old love songs, offends a brother of mine, I don't want to listen to those songs when I'm with him. <laughs> I'm not talking about these new, wicked, lustful ungodly song people produce. I'm talking about those great, pure love songs of old. And I see, I, I never went to a dance. I never went to a concert. Not because I'm good, because I had a pastor that said, you don't want to go to those worldly things. I had a parent that were dealing with me about it. And uh, so... People were working with me to try to keep me out of wicked places. But uh, the Spirit of the Lord will quicken us about certain things in our life. If gossip is still, still a problem in our life, after all the lessons we learned on judgment, with our pastor trying to help us to understand, we can't get by with that with God. If we don't love our brothers and sisters, how can we say we love God? And so love is the, the main force behind everything. So personal convictions are real things. Uh, 
I could list some, some personal convictions that seem odd to most people here. But for that person, the Spirit has dealt with them. The Spirit is to guide us. Those that are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. If we shut the voice of the Spirit down in our mind and heart, and we shut off the direction on how to be ready when the Lord comes back. If we are vulnerable in certain areas, certain types of sins, have that besetting sin we've not overcome, the Lord through his spirit will deal with us about it, and we need to hear the voice of the Lord. Then there's the pastoral rules. Personal convictions, then the pastor has obligation to set some rules in this house and to uh, make, make some decisions on some things. And the uh, Bible says, Obey them that have the rule over you, and submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls, as they that must give an account, that they may go, do it with joy and not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you. And so submitting to the direction of the pastor is vital. That's where a lot, a lot of people, they have a figurehead as a pastor in their mind and in their church setting. But the scripture tells us to submit ourselves to those that have rule over us. I know, yeah, anybody that's, any time there's authority given, someone's going to misuse it, right? That doesn't give me saying, well, I'm not going to ever submit. It doesn't give me the right to say, I don't, I'm not going to submit because someone way over in Timbuktu misused it. I'll tell you this, your pastor is a praying man, and he doesn't want to uh, require of you anything the Lord would require of you. And then, of course, are the rules of the church, the biblical standards that uh, uh, give us direction on how to get to heaven. I'm talking about working out our own salvation with fear and trembling. And so it's important that we open ourselves up to these things. And, of course, the Bible guidelines. Now, this is where uh, the Scripture rules over all. If the Bible says something is wrong, it's wrong. It doesn't need to be argued. It doesn't need to be debated. Many of the mainline denominations in our world today have fought a battle over in the last 50, 60 years over whether the Bible is the inspired word of God. I'm talking about Christian denominations. United Pentecostal Church has never had that argument. And I'm sure I can say it never will. Because we believe the word of God. It's our direction to heaven. It's our way to make it in. It's our way to please the Lord. And so we submit to the word of God. And that's where we've got to work out our salvation. A lot of people look at the Bible as a, a book of suggestions. And just uh, if you feel like doing it good, if you don't, well, uh, I guess the Lord will take care of it somehow. And uh, it's just it's so important that we realize the word is the word. And it's clearly stated. There's guidelines in the scriptures on how we live, how we work, how we dress, how we treat people, how we are entertained, how we represent Christ, how we take up our cross, deny ourselves and follow Jesus, how we speak, how we think, how we love people. How merciful we are, how kind we are, gentle, and easy to get along with most of the time, and a whole lot more. It's all written right in this book. It's not hard to understand. It's easy to understand, and that's why the Scripture tells us, work out your own salvation. If you want to go to heaven, you can make it. He's given us the power of God to make it all the way. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I want to make it. How about you? Let's praise him right now. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. And so the, the, the world, of course, is pulling us to worldliness, wanting to in our, entertain our flesh, get our mind off of heavenly things. Some people are so 
The old, the old saying is some people are so heavenly minded that they're no earthly good. Well, I personally, I've never met that person. It's more like we're, we're, we're so worldly minded that we can't contribute a lot. But God has a people whose mind set on heaven, searching for a city, hallelujah, whose founder, maker was God. The Bible clearly states a number, just a list of things that are, they were sins in the Old Testament, they're sins in the New Testament. Works of the flesh are manifest. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envies, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and the such like, of which I tell you, I've told you before that I've told you in times past that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. So uh, I've got a list there to make sure I'm not guilty of any of those things. And by the power of God, I, I can stay free from those sins. Hallelujah. When uh, the, the scriptures tell us in numerous places what it takes to live pleasing to the Lord. Every one of us should be, I'm sure we are, should be more like Christ now than when we began the journey. We've come a long way. To whom much is given, much will be required, the scripture says. And so you got to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. And uh, I'm glad the Lord made it possible for us to work it out with the personal touch of his spirit dealing with us, pleading with us, you know, the easiest thing in the world is to justify ourselves. No matter what, what it is that we're doing wrong, we want to justify ourselves. That's flesh. But we're going to deny flesh and say, and let the Lord do his dealing with us. It's just really a matter of how bad we want to go to heaven. Because the scripture is clear. There was a great man that I knew for many years before he went on to his rewards, his name was E.O. Battle, a man of God that uh, before he knew the Lord, he'd, he'd get drunk just about every weekend. And the Saturday, Saturday night, the bartender called his wife. It was a small uh, area near St. Louis, but not right in the city. Bartender knew the family, called her and said, uh, you need to come get your husband or get a ride for him. He's not, he's not able to make it home tonight by himself. He's just too drunk. And uh, so she went down to the bar and picked him up, got him home. No doubt poured a gallon of coffee down him, whatever she could do to help him get sober again. But uh, during the next week, he heard about a revival. A singing evangelist was in the area. And Brother Battle uh, found his way to that church. And a week later on Saturday night, he walked into that place and praise God, something got a hold of him. And the power of the Lord came on him and God filled him with the Holy Ghost that Saturday night. And his wife had to drive him home again. But he was drunk on the new wine of the Spirit. Hallelujah. Oh, I never shall forget the day when that happened to me. How about you? Do you remember when you were filled with the Holy Ghost and fire? When the Spirit of God came into you and the joy that fills your soul. Hallelujah. It's going to be worth it all to see Jesus Christ and hear him say, well done. You say, well, man, I, I don't feel it. Well, just keep on doing well. Just get better and better and better. Study more. Learn more. You can make it. Turn to your neighbor and say, you can make it. You just got to work it out. Hallelujah. Let's stand tonight. Oh, let's praise him a little bit. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I love you, Lord. 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 Hallelujah. 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 So we've got the Spirit dealing with us. Sometimes we'll do something, and later on you'll feel that little finger of God on your heart. 
You should have done that a little different way than you did it. I've had it happen to me more than once. I'm not going on in the confessional here, but the Spirit of the Lord would press on me there. Sometimes it would get me up at night. I'd go and sit in the living room and pray a while. Say, Lord, what, what is this? And he'd say, you know what it is. You didn't need to handle it like you handle it. You said more than you needed to say. You didn't say it right. And when you slammed that door, it almost came off the hinges. Whatever it was. It's up to me to do something about that. Not justify it. I said, well, if, if, if they had done this or they had done that, or, then I wouldn't. Have. Oh, that's, that's the way uh, husbands beat their wives and get by with it, you know. If you hadn't made me so mad, I wouldn't have hit you so hard. <laughs> Duh. It's all her fault again, right? If she wouldn't have made you so mad, you'd, you'd have held on to your temper. I've already gone to meddle in heaven. I'm about to finish it up here. But uh, that's how, that's the self, the, the flesh will justify itself. Help us to humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God. We can do better with the help of God. His, his mercy will cover us. He will forgive our sins anytime we ask him to. He will help us to get up. He'll help us understand how we handle it wrong and do it right the next time and from now on. And we have the word and we have the pastor challenging us. Every time he gets in this pulpit, he's pushing us to pray, to witness, to worship, whatever the Lord has dealt with him, to get closer to Jesus, hallelujah, to get the prayer roll, room rocking and a rolling in the Holy Ghost. To get the baptistry just stirring up. Hallelujah. We all have something to contribute to the work of God. Let's praise him right now. Thank you, Jesus. I love you, my Lord. Thank you for showing us the way. Thank you for helping us to work out our salvation. Oh, God, and walk in a manner pleasing to you, Jesus. We praise you and magnify your holy name. In Jesus' precious name, amen. God bless you. Touch your neighbor. Tell him you can make it. You can make it. Thank you for watching First Church Charlotte. If you're in the Charlotte, North Carolina area, come join us at 4929 North Sharon Amity Road at the corner of Shamrock Drive. Sunday mornings at 9 and 11 a.m. and Bible study Wednesdays at 7.30 p.m. Online, find us at firstchurchclt.com or like us on Facebook or Twitter. We hope to see you soon. Come worship with us.